My dear friends, greetings. On April 12th, the trailer for a new Netflix documentary series on Cleopatra was released. And the trailer alone caused quite a stir. So why? Well, quite simply because Netflix decided to cast a mixed-race actress in the role of Cleopatra. The story reached such proportions that the Egyptian government issued a statement insisting that Cleopatra was fair-skinned and possessed Greek characteristics. For them, the heroine's appearance, well, that's a falsification of Egyptian history and a blatant historical error, made all the more serious by the fact that the series is classified as a documentary and not a dramatic work. Egyptian lawyer Mahmoud al-Samari has also filed a complaint, insisting that serious legal action be taken against those responsible for making the documentary. So, even though I've been asked a lot to debunk the subject, I decided to wait a little while to see this series before giving my opinion, because, well, I thought the trailer might present a slightly misleading version of the final product. Because this trailer revolves almost entirely around the image of a black Cleopatra. And after all, what better way to get publicity than with a little controversy? I don't care what they tell you in school. Cleopatra was black. So this series was released on May 10th, 2023, and the team and I have watched it. So let's get together for a little debriefing on the controversy. You're going to have to hang on a bit because it's going to be a long one, right? But don't worry, we'll tell you all about Cleopatra's family tree and what she might have looked like why it doesn't make much sense to talk about race during antiquity, and for that matter, even during other periods, and you'll know all about the ins and outs of the debate. We'll also take a look back at the series and its little flaws, because I think that's important. I warn you, though, that in this episode, we're going to be talking a lot about race in humans as a categorization of humans based on skin color. So, if it's useful to understand what's at stake here, we'd like to remind you that this concept has no biological reality and is used as a basis for racism. So it's not a social construct to which either I or the Nota Bene team subscribe. Now that we've got that out of the way, let's get on with it. Most people tend to think that because Cleopatra VII ruled Egypt, it's important to point out that she was Egyptian, and therefore resembled modern-day Egyptians. On the other hand, there are many people, historians, popularizers, or simple enthusiasts, who have been harping on for years that, no, Cleopatra, she is Greek, through and through. So, what's the truth? As is often the case, reality is a little more complex and nuanced than that. In 331 BCE, Alexander the Great, king of Macedonia, proclaimed himself pharaoh and ordered the construction of Alexandria, the new capital. When he died in 323 BCE, Ptolemy, one of Alexander's closest officers and governors of Egypt, emerged victorious from the succession of crisis in Egypt and took power. The first Ptolemies, they encouraged immigration and established new Greek cities on their territory, although Upper Egypt, further from the center of government, was less affected. Even so, it took only a century for Greek influence to spread throughout the country. Greek colonists took over the most important administrative positions, while the existing Egyptian elite kept their inherited positions and gradually assimilated into the Greek elite. In Cleopatra's time, mixed marriages, rare at first, began to produce an important Greek-Egyptian educated class. However, there are still some historians who assume that there must have been some institutionalized prejudice against native Egyptians. The Greeks were a privileged minority in Ptolemaic Egypt, and the Egyptians second-class citizens in their own country. Of course, things are always a little different for the monarchs, Ptolemy I and his wives. They were all of Macedonian origin, and for the rest, this was not an absolute rule. But the Lagid rulers, so the same dynasty, well, they are known to have practiced incest with great enthusiasm. They often married brothers and sisters. So, we're very well informed, and if there are any holes, well, we see them immediately. In Cleopatra VII's family tree, there are only two unknowns we're going to talk about right away. First, we'll talk about her grandmother. Cleopatra's father is Ptolemy XII Oletes, the eldest son of Ptolemy IX Soter. His mother's identity is uncertain. Ptolemy married twice to his two sisters, Cleopatra IV and Cleopatra Selene. Numerous ancient sources, notably Latin, described Ptolemy XII as an illegitimate son. Troke Pompey called him notos, meaning bastard, and Pausanias wrote that Ptolemy IX had no legitimate son. Historians are quite divided on the subject, and from what I've been able to read, the majority think that his mother was a concubine, 
probably part of the Alexandrian Greek elite, given that the rulers didn't mix too too much, as has already been said. Others have speculated that it was Cleopatra IV, the first wife and sister of Ptolemy IX, based on the fact that she was never a co-regent. This would explain why the Romans considered her son a bastard. In short, we have no idea. We just have a few paths of reflection. The second unknown after her grandmother in Cleopatra VII is her mother. And that's an unknown that makes a lot of noise and allows for a lot of speculation. Ptolemy XII married his sister Cleopatra V. We also know that he had at least five children. But be careful, because the Greek historian and geographer Strabo, who lived at the time, states that Ptolemy had only one legitimate daughter, Berenice. And Cleopatra VII, that would be an illegitimate child, and not the daughter of Cleopatra V, who, by the way, disappears from all official documents around 69 BCE, i.e. around the time Cleopatra VII would have been born. So, who knows? Cleopatra's mother may have been an unknown Greek courtesan. Or why not an Egyptian? Except that Strabo isn't the only one to have written about our Cleopatra. In fact, the most complete sources are later authors like Plutarch and Dion Cassius. They were rather pro-Rome, so they wrote in praise of Rome, in particular Octavian Augustus, Cleopatra's great enemy and founder of the Roman Empire. And strangely enough, even though they like to destroy the reputation of the Egyptian queen, making her out to be a vicious woman, a queen and a half, etc., they never repeat Strabo's words, even though it would be quite easy to accuse her of being a bastard. The few contemporary sources to Cleopatra, like Horace, for example, it's totally the same, too. There's total silence on this so-called bastardization, and the result is that most historians adhere rather to the simplest explanation. Cleopatra VII was indeed the legitimate daughter of Ptolemy XII and Cleopatra V. But it's not the only hypothesis, because Dwayne W. Roller proposed, for example, in 2010, that Cleopatra's mother, well, maybe she's a woman from the family of the high priests of Ptah. This is a family of the Egyptian elite who would have married into the Ptolemies in the past via one of the first, Berenice. The elements put forward by Roller are interesting and convincing, but they are mainly circumstantial. The third possibility is that she was simply an unknown concubine. And here, imagination's the only limit. So it's pretty hard to decide between the two theories at the moment. In any case, it's possible, but it's not certain that Cleopatra VII had Egyptian blood in her veins. If it makes people happy to play with the mystery surrounding her ancestors, I'd like to say good for them. So, what does Cleopatra look like in the end? To answer that question, we could also ask how Cleopatra's contemporaries represented her or talked about her. Well, as I've already mentioned, it was mainly the Romans who wrote about Cleopatra's life, often a few decades after her death. By compiling existing accounts, recycling old legends and rumors, they painted a portrait of the queen that was incriminating. We've seen this in other episodes. In the civil war between Octavian and Mark Anthony, Cleopatra is the foreign enemy. Some say she's beautiful, other that she's ugly but charming. Basically, it's hard to draw any conclusions. And no mention is made of her skin or hair color. And as well as being biased, right? These sources are also lacking in detail. There are almost no papyri from Alexandria, so we have no textual sources from Egypt. Fortunately, as she was also one of the most powerful women of her time and the ruler of Ptolemaic Egypt for 21 years, there's no shortage of images of her. We have a pretty good idea of how artists decided to represent her. Egyptian representations aren't much help here because they're codified and symbolic. The coins, on the other hand, are a little more interesting because they've been approved by the queen. And the majority of them feature a rather large nose, a strong chin, and the same hairstyle, a low bun, curly hair, and a diadem symbolizing Hellenistic power. So it's hard to conclude from all this that these are realistic portraits, because this is a woman who is trying to take on a role usually assigned to men. So it's quite likely that Cleopatra didn't want to appear too gentle, too feminine in these representations. It's also the perfect way to remind us of the family she belongs to, right? By associating herself with an iconography that has already been established by her predecessors. In Rome, at the end of the Republic, realism was in fashion. Like Cleopatra, she spent time in Rome, and we have a few portraits of the queen. 
So, the Berlin Cleopatra is often considered the closest portrait to what Cleopatra looked like. In particular, the nose is quite strong, although less pronounced than on the coins. But unfortunately, the colors have not been preserved over time. Finally, we're going to be left with a few frescoes, notably in Pompeii and Herculaneum, which would represent Cleopatra. And I did say would represent because it's not clearly noted that it's Cleopatra, and not all historians agree on their attributions. For example, the one that was found in a house in Herculaneum and dates from the 1st century CE. Well, there's a diadem typical of Hellenistic rulers, the Egyptian motif surrounding the portrait, which clearly suggests that this is an Egyptian queen, the hairstyle, the nose, which clearly recall Cleopatra in her official representations. And so, if this is indeed Cleopatra, it would mean that, at least for Latin artists of the 1st century CE, Cleopatra is a fair-skinned woman with curly, chestnut red hair. But what can we conclude from all this? Well, that we don't know much, because an imposing nose and curly hair seem to be the only common denominators in all the representations we've just seen. We can therefore reasonably assume that these are the only two criteria we can be fairly sure of. And even then, we'll be careful, because clearly they're not enough to conclude anything about her ethnicity. So we asked ourselves the question about her mother, and then we looked at the representation of Cleopatra. But we can also look at Ptolemy. A third method to study the ancestry of Cleopatra VII. Well, it would be to simply look at her corpse. We might be able to extract enough DNA from it to find out more, for example. But, unfortunately, her tomb has never been found. What about the other members of her family? Well, as you can see, no bodies have ever been found. There is one body that is often associated with the family, but again, this is a rather flimsy hypothesis. Arsinoe IV, Cleopatra's sister, died in Ephesus, Asia Minor, during her exile in 41 BCE, probably murdered by the queen seeking to secure her throne. In 1929, a tomb called the Octagon was excavated and the skeleton of a 14 to 17-year-old girl was unearthed. And in 94, 65 years later, the Austrian Archaeological Institute resumed excavations at Ephesus. Researcher Heike Truel proposed that the octagon was simply the tomb of Arsinoe IV. Truel's arguments are as follows. Firstly, the tomb is octagonal, like the second level of the Alexandria Lighthouse. Secondly, the dating of the bones corresponds to the period between 220 BCE. And thirdly, Egyptian motifs would be present in the tomb. Fourthly, the skeleton is that of a young girl aged between 14 and 17. This hypothesis goes even further, since the skeleton's skull was lost during the Second World War. Chul will use measurements and photos from the period to study the subject and make a facial reconstruction with the help of a forensic anthropologist. Using this information, he concludes that the girl probably had African and Greek ancestors. Except that, as many historians have pointed out, this doesn't really hold water. For one thing, Arsinoe IV died when she was over 20, not between the ages of 14 and 17. Obviously, since we don't know her exact date of birth, we can assume that historians' estimations are wrong and that she was in fact much younger than the age conventionally attributed to her. But it's still a pretty risky bet for Thur, because you'd still have to prove how the historians got it wrong. The other reason is that there is no information in the tomb to link it to a member of the Ptolemaic royal family. There are no inscriptions in the tomb or other sources that mention the princess's resting place. And the history of the shape of the second level of the Alexandria Lighthouse, the same could be said of all octagonal buildings built at the same time in this case, so it doesn't hold up too well. The most annoying problem in all of this is the use of measurements and the supposed shape of the skull to conclude the ethnicity of the deceased. It's called craniometry, and it's pseudoscience, plain and simple. Craniometry was developed in the 19th century. It was part of a set of disciplines that would form on the observation of the skull and facial features to deduce human characteristics, such as gender, intelligence, kindness, viciousness, and obviously race of the individual. So, as you can imagine, as well as being extremely racist, these theories have no scientific basis, as has been proven time and time again. But they were also used at the time to justify the superiority of the white race over others. 
so it's quite astonishing that they should be used in the 90s by a researcher who, on top of that, is basing himself on measurements taken 65 years earlier. It's not really serious. So, no, the octagon of Ephesus is probably not the tomb of Arsinoe IV. And even if it was, we couldn't deduce her ethnicity from the shape of the skull found in the tomb. And I thought it was important to make a point on this, because those who claim that Cleopatra was of black descent often make this argument. What I propose now is that we look at the problem from a different angle. I told you that no ancient text mentions her skin color, but why not? Well, in fact, it wasn't as important. The modern concepts of race, i.e. the binary vision of blacks versus whites, Europeans, and others, it hasn't always existed. So, obviously, that doesn't mean that there wasn't discrimination, that we couldn't see a form of racism, just that it wasn't based on the same markers and the same characteristics. The choice of skin color, for example, as a characteristic of racial identity, is cultural and social. So it's really important to understand the historicity of the concept of race, especially because we tend to see it as something fairly universal and objective, as if it were a classification that has always existed. But in reality, the current notion of race based on skin color is not a universal response to human variation. Actually, it's the specific product of popular beliefs that were developed between the 16th and 19th century, so it's much later. These beliefs, they were initiated in a specific context of exploitation of the world by Europeans and the way Europeans wanted to perceive foreigners over time. And of course, these beliefs have evolved to be intimately linked to the justification of the superiority of the white race and its domination over other races. These are all categorizations that don't really make sense when it comes to studying ancient civilizations. So we have a lot of historians who defend another point of view, and that is to say, but to ask whether Cleopatra is black or white, in fact, is a bad question. It's discussing things that had no historical reality, instead of trying to understand how ancient civilizations precisely apprehended their own identity. We know, for example, that the Greeks and Romans would never have considered themselves part of the same racial or identity group with others on the basis of their skin color. Nor can all Greeks and Romans be considered to have had the same skin tone, let alone the ancient Egyptians. Given that the family has lived in Egypt for over 300 years, it's probably obvious that Cleopatra considered herself Egyptian. But at a time when being Egyptian could mean a lot of things, and not necessarily the same thing as today. So there you go. As we've seen, the Ptolemaic Egyptian world was quite imbued with Hellenic and Greek culture. Cleopatra and her family probably saw themselves as monarchs of this culture. Blending Hellenistic and Egyptian culture. But really, it's all guesswork. Because it's impossible to know how they saw each other in private. So, we can legitimately ask ourselves the question, what exactly is the debate about Cleopatra's skin color? All of it, it doesn't really make sense. In fact, it's a very American debate to begin with. American history is particularly sensitive to everything that touches racism. On one side, Europeans, and on the other, black Africans who have been separated by centuries of slavery, racial theories that they justify, and laws and practices of violent action to enforce this segregation. This white versus black binarization, though basically an arbitrary concept, was also codified in US law until 1967. For example, it would have sufficed to have a single black ancestor to be considered a person of color at the time. While on the other hand, a mixed race person with a single white ancestor, they couldn't afford to be considered white. In short, if officially racism does not exist, in reality it remains quite rooted in mentalities with two quite distinct skin colors and one supposedly superior to the other because more selective. So even if these kinds of laws have disappeared since 1967, that doesn't mean their influence won't last. Even today we have certain American citizens, but also intellectuals, even researchers in this country, who still resonate in a very binary way. So it's all black and white. But that doesn't mean that we're perfect in Europe either. We're, we're not perfect. 
racism exists on this side of the ocean too, and it's tending to become more and more binary, perhaps under the massive American influence. Within this framework, Afrocentrism developed in the United States in the 20th century. It all started with a rather reasonable intention, that is, to redefine an identity for Afro-Americans, and at the same time to put the spotlight back on the history of Black Africa and its descendants, which for too long had been scorned and forgotten by centuries of Eurocentric history. So, if the term has only existed since 1962, in fact, it's the legacy of the work of many Afro-American activists and intellectuals from the end of the 19th century, who in particular enabled the opening of universities to Afro-Americans. The development and spread of Afrocentrist theses can be seen in the representation of Africans in pop culture. In reaction to films in which Cleopatra is portrayed as a white woman by actresses such as Elizabeth Taylor and Lindsay Marshall, there's a black counterculture that's been created. For example, the black sculptor Edmonia Lewis chose to represent a black Cleopatra at the time of her death, and Josephine Baker refers to the queen in her costumes. In the Remember the Time clip, we also have Michael Jackson representing the Egyptians, all black, with Eddie Murphy as the pharaoh. And we're not even talking about Beyonce, who makes abundant use of references to Egyptian antiquity and Nefertiti. And now, you're getting the hang of it. The Netflix documentary is completely part of this militant movement to reappropriate a certain history of Africa in popular culture. But now, the question you're asking is, how important is ancient Egypt in these movements? In the 1950s, Egypt became the entry point for many Afrocentrist theories. The idea, in fact, is to link ancient Egyptians, Sub-Saharan Africans, and Afro-Americans in a glorious past, carried only by blacks. So I'm overstating the case. But the idea is that if ancient Egypt is a black civilization, then black people are the ones who brought civilization, science, and literature to the rest of the world. And so they've proven their pretty undeniable contribution to world history. And that's where, in fact, the binarity I was talking about before is really important. For it to work, ancient Egypt has to be entirely populated by black people. So it's a militant approach that doesn't really seek to make history, but rather to take revenge for the crimes committed by whites in the past sometimes going so far as to argue that blacks are superior to whites. So we're not going to go into the details of this debate, because the video could go on for another hour. But I really encourage you to go and see the Passé Sauvage video on the subject. It's really top-notch, and I'm including it in the description. Let's go back and start from the beginning, shall we? Uh, the Mediterranean was an area of intense exchange throughout antiquity and beyond. What's more, Egypt is at the crossroads of three continents and two seas. So if you've been to Cairo, but also to Greece, Turkey, and even the French coastal ports, you know it stands out like a sore thumb. We're dealing with very diverse areas, with a rather incredible ethnic multiplicity. And you add to that centuries of slavery and cultural and commercial exchanges between Europe, Arabia, North Africa, Central Africa, but also very clear divisions between castes, slaves, and free men, for example. And you get a really big question mark. Clearly, these are not populations that are all black or all white on one side or the other. What do Egyptians think? As Bassem Youssef, a well-known Egyptian actor who criticizes the Netflix series, recalls in an interview with British TV host Piers Morgan, Why is African-American people are telling my own history? Well, it's not a question of skin color, because back in Liz Taylor's day, Egypt also criticized a pale Cleopatra. The real question is rather that of having an American vision that is very, very focused on skin color, that is going to impose itself on the country's past. To be honest, the way the American vision slices up the world doesn't really fit with reality. Because Africa isn't a block with a single nationality, a single skin color. It's not a black civilization, just as there hasn't been a white civilization. Africa is already very different from Europe. And even within Europe, there are Celts, Scandinavians, Germanics, Siberians, etc. And in Africa, there are Malians, Tuaregs, Berbers, Ethiopians, Egyptians, etc. There are many stories and histories to tell. The desire to rediscover Afro-American roots is understandable, 
But from what I've read, whether it's criticism from scientists, the government, or the Egyptian press, the demand is always more or less the same. Why not refocus on the real Cleopatra? Why not focus the documentary on Egypt? Why try to place Egypt on a continent with only one supposed skin color? Anyway, now we can ask ourselves another question. Is the documentary good or not? As expected, the documentary is much more measured than the trailer. The first episode opens with the idea of a black Cleopatra, with Professor Haley's famous line, Whatever they tell you at school, Cleopatra was black. But when the subject of Cleopatra's ancestry really comes up a little later, she makes it clear that she's sure of nothing. Still, it has to be said that the documentary chooses to give much more support to this theory than to any other, and it doesn't go into too much detail. They also make the interesting choice of insisting on the fact that Cleopatra is what we call today a proxy. In fact, it's an image that everyone can decide to imagine, explore, and reappropriate. At least, they're pretty honest about it. But it's still problematic in a documentary that doesn't dwell on representations of Cleopatra in history, but really tackles the historical figure of Cleopatra. And it's a shame, because it could have been quite relevant to study how Cleopatra's character, or the, the fictional Cleopatra, has been explored over time. Without going into the details of every error and approximation, this documentary has three major flaws in its historical methodology. The first is to try to apply modern concepts to an ancient civilization at all costs. We've explored the concept of race well enough here, and it should have no place here. And yet, on that point, well, that's where the documentary opens, and this vocabulary problem comes up all the time in the documentary. For example, when Cleopatra makes her first royal pilgrimage because she wants to integrate with the people, no, she's a queen goddess. She's not there to integrate with the peasants. In a way, you could say she's asserting her power, reinforcing her legitimacy, her attributes, her symbolism, and that they'll enable her to impose herself. And in fact, the documentary is often like that. It's not mean, but it's off the mark. The other problem is also the desire for storytelling, inventing intentions for Cleopatra or other characters. This is fine in the fictional parts, which are performed by actors, but it's much more annoying when it's a scientist speaking. And some of them actually speak more like... Cleopatra groupies than historians interested in the facts. To say that she felt closer to the Egyptian people, that she would adore the Library of Alexandria, that's pure speculation. In history, you almost never know a person's intentions or thoughts. For all we know, Cleopatra loved to read, but she had all her writings delivered to her palace because she hated the library because of the noise. Frankly, we don't know. And the documentary plays the storytelling card to the hilt. So really, it's entertaining, it gets the point across, but it sounds fake, a bit like a legend or a tale. And it's a poor representation of what history is as a discipline, which is a shame in a documentary. The final flaw, which is also one that could be blamed on many other Netflix documentaries, is the willingness to present just one version, without mentioning that there are others. So, it makes sense, especially since there's a fiction part to this kind of production. So you have to find a compromise. But the problem is that the viewer lacks perspective on what is being said, and has the impression that this version is the only one. For example, at the end of episode 1, it is suggested that the civil war in Alexandria led to the burning of the library. That's one hypothesis, but it's clearly not the most scientifically supported. Today's historians seem to be in pretty good agreement to refute this possibility completely. If the fire of Alexandria did lead to the destruction of the library's warehouses near the harbor, in fact, it was not the library that remained flourishing for several decades after Caesar's expedition to Egypt. In the end, the documentary could be said to be mostly boring, right? Cleopatra's story has been told many times before, and the only originality here is the idea that Cleopatra might have been a black queen except that it's only used to attract viewers with a controversial trailer. This docufiction is part of a series about African queens. Season 1, for example, focuses on Zinga, queen of the Ndugo and Matamba kingdoms. So why choose a queen as famous as Cleopatra in Season 2? A mystery. If we absolutely had to talk about Egypt, it might have been a bit more interesting to talk about Hatshepsut, for example. And there are a quite a few other African queens we never hear about, but who clearly deserve their own documentary seasons.
We could, for example, mention Tassan Hangbei, the Queen of Abome, the Queen of Sheba, Queen Candace Amanishaheto of Meroe. We could also talk about Ndate Yala, the last great queen of the Walo. In any case, we'll see what the third season comes up with, and maybe they'll deal with these characters. In the meantime, I hope this episode has given you a little more insight. Thanks for watching all the way through. If you would like to support us, share this episode. Please also be measured and nuanced when you ask questions about history, because it's always super important. Thanks to Hélène Poli and Jean Boissesson for their research and writing. If you want more Nota Bene content, head over to Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, Facebook. We're all over the place. Until next time.